Uh, we're going to start today with an introduction by Rabbi Alan Alpert from the um, Temple in Tanu Temple Bene Israel, uh, which this exhibit is uh, part of and why we're doing this program tonight for you. So I'll turn it over to him to tell you a little bit about the Tikkun Olam Festival and what it means. There you are. Oh, hi. Welcome. Um, we want to thank everybody at the um, museum, the Lakeshore Museum, and also our presenters. The concept of Tikkun Olam is an old one. And to introduce that, I sent a video to Patrick from a very distinguished rabbi, Rabbi Arthur Green. He was ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary and earned his doctorate at Brandeis University. He has taught in many different institutions and he was the co-founder of the Hebrew College in Boston. I think that you appreciate his words. And with that, um, Patrick, if you're willing to show the video, if you would please do so. The Jewish people has been exiled from its land since the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Before that, the temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians, and that consciousness of exile became a very deep part of the Jewish mentality. We are in exile, but one day we will be restored. That sense of exile, you can say, goes back even farther than the first destruction of the temple. It goes back to the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden itself. Once we left Eden, all humanity, you may say, is in exile, we live in an exilic world, and we long to be restored to the original home, to the original Eden in which human beings were created. That sense of exile and redemption, long exile, longing for redemption, has very much been a part of the Jewish religious mentality for thousands of years. Tikkun olam means working to bring about the end of that exile, means repairing the world, bringing the sparks of light back, discovering the goodness of God wherever it's scattered. How do we do that? We do that by living with other people. We do that by doing acts of goodness, acts of human kindness. Every time you do good, you are raising up some of that light, making the world a better place, bringing the presence of God into greater clarity in your life and in the lives of those around you, um, and bringing Messiah's arrival one step closer. We have to do everything we can to make that arrival more possible by making the world better, by bringing about some bit of redemption in our own lives. Jews have understood that very well, partly because of the suffering and oppression that's been so much a part of our history. And therefore, many Jews, even if they don't think of themselves as religious, don't know very much about the tradition, bear within them that sense of making the world a better place is something we have to do. We're very proud of the fact that many Jews, even if they see themselves as secular, have somehow deeply within them a sense that I have to work to make the world better. I have to work for more human decency, for more human rights, for more recognition of every human being as the image of God. That sense that we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, that sense that we know the soul of the stranger because we were oppressed, that sense that we have long been in exile and we have to help others redeem their worlds as we redeem ours, is a very deep part of the Jewish soul and the Jewish experience through our history. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and get started with some of our speakers. And the way uh, we're going to do this tonight is each speaker is going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes or so. A few of them have some slides they're going to show us or some images. And what we're going to do is we're going to wait for our questions till the uh, very end here. And then we'll kind of open it up to more of a larger group discussion if we have questions or comments on it. Uh, and hopefully everything will run pretty smoothly for us here. So our first speaker tonight is Kerry Vanderhoff from the Coalition for Community Development. Um, Carrie and I have actually worked together on a project um, for our community here, making a loan kit, talking about the African American experience in Muskegon County. And the Coalition for Community Development does a lot of work. Uh, it was founded in 2005 by Dr. Doris uh, Ruckus, 
or Brooks, sorry, excuse me. Uh, and it was for the community of Muskegon Heights and founded in the area. Uh, they help in a variety of ways, including beautification projects, uh, community and school gardens, library support and literacy program, and collaborating with different neighborhood associations and other organizations such as the museum on various projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie and she'll tell you a little bit about the Coalition for Community Development and how they're serving the community. And we'll get her slides right up for you. Distance. Okay, okay to just get started. Or should I wait for the slide? Yep. You can go get started. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Carrie Vanderhoff, as, as Patrick said, and um, with the Coalition for Community Development, I wanted to take a moment really to uh, so forth this on the slide with uh, Dr. Doris Rutz. I want to make sure that we're uh, looking at our founder, founded in 2005 and again, based in Muskegon Heights, Michigan. And the majority uh, of the Board of Trustees are residents from Muskegon Heights. Uh, so it's very important that, that we're working very, very close with a grassroots organization. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Doris Rutz just quickly, uh, because while she's no longer with us physically, uh, she really is in everything that we do. And she and social, social justice um, really go hand in hand. Uh, shortly after her passing in 2016, MLI wrote uh, Rux's uh, um, Muskegon activism, activism began early when she was in her 20s. She helped found the Citizens Recreation Association to provide better housing, living conditions, and recreation for the scores of Black Southerners who migrated to Muskegon to work in the factories during World War II. In 1949, the association transformed into the Urban League of Greater Muskegon, and equality became its focus. She remained active with the Urban League, the NAACP, and Black Women's Political Caucus. In 2005, Rux founded the Coalition for Community Development, uh, which became her lasting legacy. Uh, so the mission of the CCD is, the focus is empowering one another. And as Patrick also mentioned, we do this in a variety of ways uh, through our school and community gardens, um, libraries, beautification. Uh, because the population of Muskegon Heights is majority Black, African American, throughout these programs and things we do, um, really we, we address both cause and effect of uh, systemic racism. So uh, one thing that we were recognized for recently through the Community Foundation for Muskegon County uh, was their lead giving uh, Circles First JEDI grant, J-E-D-I, the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and CCD was recognized for that. So just a little background on CCD and um, our founder, Dr. Doris Rutz. Oh, we're not on, are we on the screen with Dr. Doris Rutz? Yeah. Okay, so why storytelling? Next slide. Uh, I'm not only the executive director of CCD, I also teach film and video. I'm an adjunct professor at GVSU. Um, so storytelling is something that I really, the power of the story in words, but especially in the visual image, uh, is something that um, is really close to my heart. And uh, I thought that I would share with you before I started a little uh, exercise that I do with some of my um, uh, lower level uh, film stu school uh, students that come in. And what you see up there on the screen is a storyboard. In Hollywood and pre-production, before you go in and make movies, uh, you shot by shot by shot, you uh, sort of draw out or show what each shot will look like. What will be the lighting? What's the framing as far as uh, camera angles? What music will go behind there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I do a little um, exercise uh, with the class and I ask, the students to pick a classic fairy tale, uh, something really well known, been around a while, and retell the story. Don't change the progression of events. Don't change the characters, but just reframe it. Um, reframe it so that perhaps the lighting's different, focuses on different characters. Um, and so then I get them in groups with a bunch of markers and, um, and they get started. And sometimes I go around and help them. One of the ones that almost comes around all the time is Goldilocks, right? And so turning that around, um, putting a framework, you know the story of Goldilocks. We usually meet Goldilocks, um, get to know the innocent little blonde uh, girl kind of going through the woods, probably looking at butterflies. She comes across the cottage, goes in and tries the different things and ends up in the, in the bed and the bears come in and scare, scare her uh, and she goes running away. And the students will, frame it where we get to know the bear family first. 
and we get to understand who they are and the things they like to do and the loving um, interactions between the bear family. And then, you know, after several minutes of getting to know them, when they go home, they see that their house has been broken into, they see that their food has been eaten, they see that chairs have been broken, and somebody's still there. Um, so as you can see, framing, framing can kind of change uh, how, who we sympathize with and who we follow it in the story. So um, students usually have a lot of fun with that, especially with coloring, but the, the idea is um, the importance of framing. And framing, I took some information from Frameworks Institute. Um, framing is about the choices we make and what we say and how we say it and what we leave unsaid. So framing plays a major role in social change. Um, the way in which the world is imagined determines any particular moment uh, and what people will do. And frameworks ask us to consider as well the difference between charity and justice framing. Charity framing on social issues encourages us to focus on the needy and the vi visible symptoms of that need. This frame invites sympathy and asks for individuals to take steps to help those experiencing difficulty. Justice framing, in contrast, highlights the setup of society and our shared commitment to fairness. This frame emphasizes systems and the conditions of well being and ask for collective action to make things right. Um, and then it goes on with some other uh, things on, on the website, very helpful, but should, I, should my mission-driven organization try to frame our issue? And the answer really is we're already framing our issue, whether we realize it or not. Um, there is no such thing as an unframed communication. And since we're always framing, we should frame strategically. And think about those voices that maybe are less heard. Think about the different perspectives. Think about um, understanding what story is being told. And am I framing my issue effectively? What does it mean to reframe a social issue, et cetera? Some of these things can be found uh, on the Framing Institute's website. Um, okay, so next slide. I just wanna talk a little bit about, now that I've sort of um, uh, established framing and storytelling, some of the past collaborations and initiatives that CCD has done in this area of storytelling, both written word and also uh, visual. Um, at CCD, we don't want to tell stories about residents in Muskegon Heights. We are there to work together so residents um, will be telling their own stories, right, unmediated, um, without sort of going through several different channels. And one past collaboration was something called Photo Voice. It's actually been around several decades. Uh, it was founded by um, Carolyn C. Wang and Mary Ann uh, Burris. And essentially, it is... Um, pulling together, gathering with a group of residents. Um, this has been done around the world. We did it in the Crescent neighborhood uh, area of Muskegon Heights and providing cameras um, and a little bit of uh, guidance on how to you know, point and shoot and take some different uh, images. And then we asked a question, um, what are your hopes and dreams for your family, um, yourself, and what in your community supports that and what gets in the way of that? And we met once a week over dinner and um, they came back with, with images that sort of took pictures. Some were very, very um, sort of representational. The more we talked over the weeks, though, they became um, more and more abstract, right? And, the, and we started to, at first, just identify issues, areas of strength, areas of concern. Um, but then it moved on to root cause analysis. And from there, uh, it, it even began to think about what are some things we can do internally and what are some things we can do reaching out to others uh, to address the root causes of some of these things um, or build upon the strengths as well. So that's uh, important that we, that we look at the big picture. Um, one of the examples, um, oh, and, and the thing about photo voices, statistics and, and big you know, quantitative data is important, but qualitative data, those stories, those individual stories, that's, that's the human to human interaction. That's where you really sort of um, get to know individuals and then it can kind of, it represents. And I just want to say a couple of these, you can see that we had a, an exhibition where they had the images and then the narrative. Uh, the residents wrote their own narratives after discussing this over several weeks. Again, they signed off. It's their words. A um, couple of the stories, one was uh, a picture of potholes. Everybody, you know, potholes. Uh, but it, this, as the story went, and this is why lived experience and working directly with individuals um, who live, who live, have those lived experiences. Um, they said that they'd like those potholes to be fixed, but not before there is some rental units at the end of the street and there's been some uh, activity down there that creates sort of traffic to go barreling down the street. 
And right now, uh, the residents say those potholes are the only things that are slowing down the traffic, right? So we'd like those potholes to get fixed, but only after maybe discussing um, sort of the activity happening down the street and also speed bumps or some other way because there's children playing on the street. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, when you ask the question about what do you love about Muskegon Heights, one of my favorite stories in, in the Photo Wars book was um, uh, everybody knows everybody, right? Um, people uh, like to hang out in the, on their front porch and say hello to everybody who's going by. And they, they, uh, the response was there's so many communities, you know, people drive in, the garage door opens, they park, and you never see anybody again. Uh, and it was just a really sort of a, a joyous story about the community um, being small enough to know everyone and looking out for each other. So some great stories uh, in that photo voice exhibition. And then next slide. Uh, another past collaboration. This is something that Patrick did mention, but um, kind of started with uh, two parts. One was the local Muskegon chapter of the NAACP is, was celebrating their 100th, 100th anniversary in um, Muskegon County in 2019. So we partnered with the with the NAACP and uh, we recorded oral histories of those individuals now in their 80s and 90s uh, who had lived through the height of the civil rights era. And so this is important. Again, first person stories, um, unmediated telling their story. Uh, we worked with NACP. Um, they were involved in, in all of the editing, signing off, uh, even down to the music um, and the rights um, and the footage remained with the NACP in that um, that video is available. They've agreed to um, include that in that educational loan kit here at the museum. So that's on the other side of this slide. It's called Who Gets to Tell the Story Matters, again, framing. Um, but it's the kit that has not only the civil rights focus in it with that video and other things available, um, also a section on first and notables, those who were born and raised here and um, you know, first in, in science or arts or politics, uh, sports, etc., cetera, um, or have moved away, um, but were from here as well and then stories from the community. With COVID, a little bit lacking on, on getting some of those, but there's things about festivals and, and whatnot. So that, those educational loan kits, um, those can be checked out for different schools and what they are. Keep an eye on my time. Next slide. Current collaborations and initiatives, working very closely with the Neighborhood Association Council. Um, when the governor of Michigan, uh, she uh, put out a directive and an order, a, a, an executive order uh, saying that um, stating that racism was a public health crisis and then uh, forming of a black leadership advisory council and the residents of Muskegon Heights through the neighborhood associations wanted to respond to that that um, they are um, here and ready to uh, give feedback and really want to be a part of that data collection process and keep bringing it closer to home one thing uh, as noted in in this booklet that they sort of stated and, and sent to the, the governor um, and have shared among is that a lot of times the, the information that's collected, surveys, questionnaires, is, is pulled from outside of the community and analyzed outside. And as we've already seen with the photo voice, the closer to the lived experience, the more the analysis will not miss some of those nuances and especially the strengths um, as well as the concerns. And so there's some stories in this booklet and also we're working with them to build sort of an infrastructure of that uh, data collection of of surveys and stories um, and being able to sort of move that process forward so they can not only advocate uh, work work that data for their own advocacy um, for writing grants for the community but also when working with others um, at seat at the table and share that information and um, oh the other one thursday night inspiration through generations that's just a little little heads up but we can skip to the um, storytelling series and um, storytelling series kind of pulls this all together right it's the um, collecting of the data, and then from there, themes have come forward and we're moving into telling those stories in a visual way. So look forward to that. You can go to our website and see more of that. So thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Our next presenter is going to be Michael Pine from Health West. Uh, Michael has worked with Health West, or not the Health West, I should say, for about 36 years and has been here in Muskegon for about 20 of those years. So, um, excuse me, in the past nine years, he's done a lot of work with community relations here in the department and doing community outreach and community service as well. Um, a lot of his work has been focused on prevention and assisting uh, families when dealing with uh, negative community mental health uh, issues in the system and also working with uh, suicide prevention as well. So 
Uh, we're going to turn it over to Michael, whose presentation will be virtual here, so we'll flip it over to him in one second. Okay. Everyone can see and hear me. All right, technology. I got to wait for the technology to kind of catch up with me. I appreciate the opportunity this evening uh, to speak with you. And again, my name is Michael Pine and I do work for HealthWest. I've been in the um, mental health field for 36 years, which is almost hard for me to believe. And so uh, I do a lot of presentations to the community, a great deal of which have over the last nine years been around suicide prevention. But I also talk to people about mental health concerns and, of course, the services that are offered through Health West. So before I really get going this evening, I want to acknowledge the hostage situation in Texas at the synagogue and just express, you know, my condolences and um, uh, just kind of the sorrow around these events that seem to continue to happen in this country. So with that, I will say that we have these events in our lives. This particular event, of course, has an impact in the community, obviously the individuals who are there, the individuals who attend uh, synagogue there. And then it has farther reaching effects to those um, of the Jewish faith around the country and even around the globe. And a lot of the work that we do it, and, and a, a lot of the, let's say the precipitating factors in mental health concerns are quite often going to be around trauma. A great deal of the concerns that we see in terms of mental health will be around trauma. And not of course, just within the Jewish uh, community, but also within all other groups and marginalized groups, especially. We have a long history of what we would call generational trauma. There's a lot of debate in the country too at this point in time around talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. And unfortunately, there's a lot of divisive um, kind of discussions around these things. But I'm here to say, and as our first speaker mentioned, um, racism and these types of discriminations are in fact a health problem and they do impact us and they impact us all. And generational trauma is a part of that. And so with generational trauma, it's not as if our ancestors or our grandparents and our parents want to instill a trauma into us. I don't think that it's ever an intentional thing. No one wants to traumatize their children and their children's children. But the reality is, is these traumas follow us. For a while, I lived in England uh, in the 80s during what they called the Troubles. And occasionally bombs would go off in London where I lived. And it would be attributed to a group, um, usually out of Ireland. Um, and there were times, and I, I recall a time when somebody there blew up a bridge in Ireland because of an event that had occurred 700, 900 years ago. And I remember at the time thinking seven to 900 years ago and they're doing this act of terrorism for something that occurred seven to 900 years ago. And quite often when we talk about slavery, for example, a lot of times people will say that's 400 years ago, we need to stop, we need to set these things aside. And certainly with the genocides that have occurred uh, within indigenous people in this country and certainly within the Jewish community, um, this generational trauma exists and it is real and it does get passed down and it does have an impact. And it gets passed down through telling stories through families, of course, and just recalling the histories and seeing what's out there and sometimes even just recognizing that you're a part of this group and that trauma has been there. But along with that trauma, I, I believe too that there are also incredible stories of resilience and healing and, and making things whole, making things better again. So I come to you tonight on the heels of this event, unfortunately, that unfolded over the weekend in Texas to just extend an apology and also hopefully a bit of some understanding from an outsider looking in, but also just as somebody out there in the world who has worked with mental health. And sometimes these events can seem distant and they can seem very far away from us, but they can still also be extremely triggering to people. 
And we have to be aware of that. We have to reach out and we have to check on each other and touch base. So I just sort of extend that to you um, to use this opportunity to just kind of check on people around. So with that, I'll say the work that we do here around mental health is with the community mental health, Health West, where I work, uh, we serve by law since 1963, John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act and uh, they're therefore mandated by law to be in place around the nation. And that's what Health West is. And we serve individuals who have a developmental disability or they have a mental illness or they have a substance use concern. These are all behavioral health con component, uh, you know, concerns. They all involve mental health. And I, I wanna always start when I do my presentations or when I talk to groups of people with, I, I always want to make the statement that mental health concerns, mental illness is not about a personal weakness. Mental illness is not about a personality flaw. It's about an organ in the body, our brain not doing what we wish it would do or malfunctioning in some way. And while psychiatry and the field isn't necessarily, you know, uh, there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of understanding the human brain. It's a very, very complex organ, as we all know. But the reality is, it's a brain that is not working correctly. It's not about a personality flaw. It is not about a personal weakness. And what impacts that brain quite often to send it on a trajectory of perhaps heading down the path towards a mental illness, depression, anxiety, these types of things is going to be trauma. And it doesn't take us very long in popular culture to see that trauma is at the core of most um, behavioral health concerns, addiction, mental illness. We don't need to look any farther than television and My 600 Pound Life or the hoarder shows or the intervention shows of which there are many, many, many. I try not to spend a lot of time with these shows, right? Because of the work that I do. Also, I don't necessarily feel that they're the best at um, providing understanding to people who watch them when it comes to behavioral health concerns. But what I do know is the vast majority of people who participate in these shows or are shown on these shows probably don't actually want to be there. Oftentimes they're there because they're getting their house cleaned up for free or they're being provided weight loss surgery for free, et cetera. But what we learn from even the pop culture and what's on television around these, and these are mental health concerns, is that within the first 10 minutes of any one of those shows, you're going to hear about some sort of trauma. And Unfortunately, they don't spend enough time talking about the trauma and the pathway to healing, but through these stories on television that we are obviously very attracted to because the shows are popular and they remain on television. We watch other people suffering, I suppose in some way that makes us feel a little bit better, but I also think in some ways the storytelling there we can also relate to, but hopefully we're hearing the beginning parts of those where they're often describing some trauma and most often that trauma has occurred in youth. We don't talk enough about mental health concerns in our community and in, in our culture here. We don't talk enough about it. Certainly, I'm 60 years old in a couple of days. Uh, my generation doesn't so much. Certainly, my father's generation, very little, if at all. Young people are a little better at it. They give me some hope. I have some, you know, I have some positive feeling about it. But what I can tell you is um, information about mental health, while it's becoming a little more, um, you know, it's easier to find information about mental health and mental well-being, it's still a bit of a challenge. Mental health problems develop, the majority of them are going to develop when we're very young, before the age of 24. Uh, quite often a mental health problem is going to be out there. There's very few psychiatrists out there in the world. Not as many as there are people who need a psychiatrist. It's hard for us to find them. It's hard for us to hire them. Encourage people to go into being a doctor and then tell them to choose psychiatry if you know anybody is interested. Um, lots of opportunity. We know that early intervention leads to better health outcomes. We know that when we talk about mental health concerns, when we're open about these things, when we turn to our friends and those people around us and family members, and we say, how are you doing emotionally? How is your mental health doing, right? We reduce stigma. 
And that might be startling or shocking for some of us to do, but the reality is, is after a while, it's going to be okay. And I will tell you, I feel like young people understand this because young people, and I'm talking high school, up into college age, even sometimes a little bit older, are much more apt to talk to their friends and associates about mental health problems in a pretty free and easy way that we all should be doing. And it helps. It helps reduce that stigma and it helps get people to the help that they need. And so I talk about mental health. When I go out and talk about mental health, I always want to talk about these situations. Mental health problems are very, very common. And as we're in the middle of COVID here, I think a lot of Pre-COVID, one in five of us was going to have a mental health crisis in any given year. That's one in five of us. One in four children, uh, high school and below, 25% of young people are going to have a mental health crisis in any given year. And mental illness, depression is one of the leading causes of disability around the globe. But during COVID, one out of 11 adults seriously considered suicide. So during COVID, one out of 11, not Fleeting thought, not eh, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, maybe not so bad. One in 11 adults seriously considered suicide. So if you count the number of friends you have, family members, people around you, every time you hit the number 11, that person could have been that one who had serious thoughts of suicide. Um, the, the actual suicide rate during COVID decreased, and most people are not aware of that. Many people believe that the suicide rate has increased, and that's simply not true. It decreased. And so uh, we know through all the research into pandemics and epidemics that the suicide rate would likely decrease. It was the first decrease we saw in 30 years. But we know that after the threat of the pandemic has passed, that the suicide rate will likely spike up a little bit. It may not do that if we're all willing to reach out to those people around us, share the stories that we have about our own mental health challenges that maybe we've had in our lifetimes, reach out to other people and ask them how they're doing, learn about people, learn about their stories, and hopefully have a better understanding about mental health around us. With that, I will say that Health West is here in the community for everyone, regardless of insurance, regardless of ability to pay, we're going to do a full assessment for people. And so I wanna put that out there. So I started with talking about generational trauma and the fact that we pass this down from generation to generation, not with intention, we don't want to traumatize future generations, but we also want people to remember what happened so things do not happen again. We have to understand that that generational trauma is out there. It's a real thing. It impacts people. And then on top of those things, other, other burdens may fall. And so as we're telling our stories within our communities and within our own families, those stories of resilience, of which there are so many, we have to also focus on those. And while and acknowledging the traumatic parts and acknowledging the difficulties and the struggles, also um, emphasizing the resilience and how people have come to overcome these uh, traumas that have befallen them in the past. And so with that, I will stop and I will turn it over to our moderator and the next person up. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, we're gonna move on now to our next presenter. I would also be presenting virtually. So we have Kim DeMet from Every Woman's Place who's gonna be next on our uh, schedule here. So Kim, for the past two years, has worked as the executive director of Every Woman's Place. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree of political science from the University of Arizona and a master's of administration from Northern Arizona University. Um, prior to working at Every Woman's Place, uh, she volunteered and worked for the Resource and Crisis Center of Galveston County as their director of development, um, taking them through a capital campaign to construct a campus for all the services that they offer. So, Kim, we'll turn it over to you in one second here. Um to Khan Olam, if I'm saying that correctly. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, I really am, and I hope that you can see in the coming slides how seriously we take our work and how we try to, um, to I guess, um, counter the bad that is happening in the lives of some of our community members. So the, um, if you could do the next slide, please. The mission of Every Woman's Place is to strengthen lives in our community by providing shelter, counseling, and advocacy 
for those affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and sex trafficking. I just do want to mention, um, I, I know our name sometimes can be um, uh, a turnoff or, or, or a, a negative thing for individuals who want to seek services that are not female, but we do help all individuals. Um, we've always helped all individuals. Most recently, we've had a big push for that to be the case. And so um, anybody who needs services can come in. If it is a, a male um, who is seeking shelter services, we, we wouldn't provide them at our shelter here because it is for women and their children but we would provide them some space somewhere in the community so they were safe. I could have the next slide, please. So um, I wanted to give you an idea about our numbers. Um, numbers are very, very cold and calculated, but, but I think they're important to know what the impact is in our community. Um, and we don't see a lot of the people who, who undergo or who um, have been victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. A lot of them do not report what they, uh, have gone through because they don't feel like they have a voice. And so um, in a year, and this is generalizing, we have about a thousand of individuals that we help every year. Um, a majority of those, about 80% are domestic violence and then a smaller portion is our sexual assault, stalking and sex trafficking. And we do provide about 8,600 services a year. So all of the services that we offer, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so one person receives on average about eight to nine services. Next slide, please. So the impacts of crime and the ecological view of trauma. Um, there's three things that, that go into how an individual processes trauma that happens to them. It's their, their person, their personal traits, their history, their relationship with the perpetrator, the event itself, when it happened, how it happened and where it happened, and then their environment, how the community and their support systems um, embrace them after the victimization. The next slide, if you don't mind, please, um, is kind of telling and I'm, I'm, it gives you an idea. It's probably too small for everybody to see, but it shows you all of the different things that come into play when somebody's processing trauma. Um, you can see those three components are there, but then how they offshoot. And there's so many things that, that impact the way a person uh, responds and reacts to trauma that um, this is why individuals like um, Michael and individuals like Every Woman's Place and others in the community that, that help people through trauma um, do so because it is, it is so incredibly multifaceted and complex that it takes uh, quite a little bit to work through the issues with them so that it doesn't become multi-generational. Can I have the next slide, please? So when they come to Every Woman's Place, we take them from victimization, I always say, to restoration. That's the the goal. I wouldn't say that's always what happens, but it is the goal. And we do that with a victim-centered approach. Um, victim-centered, you know, we hear it in, in a lot of um, organizations, you know, listen to the words and, and we really do uh, practice it here in our everyday activities. Um, we seek the victim's input. Um, we don't assume anything. We respect them and we reflect with them and we give them autonomy and privacy. When they're ready to talk, we're there. We recognize how they're impacted, how they might be impacted, because how we feel they should be impacted might not truly be how they're impacted. So it's respecting where they're at. We always say we, we accept them where they're at when they come into our services, and that's very much what we do. Um, they, we focus on their safety and their well-being. Their safety and their well-being might not be what we would choose for their safety and well-being, but we need to prepare them to be safe and well no matter what situation they put themselves in. And so accepting that as a human, they may have choices that are not choices that we would make. Uh, we're very non-judgmental. We, um, we do not judge when somebody comes in. We don't judge if they uh, have suffered from a substance use disorder. What we are is we're here to take them from the point that they were victimized and take them through the steps and the services and the supports that we have in place to be able to um, hopefully have them regain some sense of, of who they were or what they want to be. If I could have the next slide. So at Every Woman's Place, we do offer advocacy. Everybody um, who enters into services with us is assigned an advocate. We do legal advocacy. Housing, we have two housing programs and we have advocacy for housing as well. We offer safe shelter, crisis intervention and safety planning. We have walk-in services. So if an individual needs something uh, and didn't plan for it, um, they can come in at any time, day or night and receive services from us. We have counseling and then we also have sober living for survivors. 
We do outreach and um, that's that's something that um, we are growing. Um, I'd like it to be more than it is, but um, we do try to reach out to the community and do presentations to schools and to individual groups about, um, about warning signs, about uh, victimization, about how to support your neighbors, your friends, your family. Um, we do oftentimes partner with the Hope Project who does sex trafficking specifically. Um, we do also participate in a multidisciplinary team with the prosecutor's office that is um, geared towards giving individuals the support they need throughout all the systems so that they'll continue with prosecution and they'll you know, go through that and hopefully be um, receive justice in some sense. We also, um, we are the chair people for the DB task force. And then we um, also chair the sexual assault response team. Um, like I said, we do many presentations around town. Um, we welcome, if you're interested to reach out, we would love to talk to your, your group or your school group or your adult group, doesn't matter. We can tailor it however you need it. And then we also have volunteers and interns in our building um, that bring a lot in our, a, um, a link between us and the community. Um, one thing we try to do and take this, um, this with all of our clients is empower them to make decisions for themselves to lead you know what they see as their their choice for life um, we do this by identifying not only the resources we have in our walls but also the ones in the community that give them what they need to be able to go forward and um, and you know, hopefully through to restoration um, we do strengths based goal setting um, for our clients and those are smart goals that they're time sensitive and and um, can lead them to a place where they want to be um, we oftentimes will use supportive community agencies to, um, to help them with life skills and healthy choices. And then we do have a match savings program here to help individuals get on their feet um, after victimization. Can I have the next slide, please? And I wanted to share this with you. I don't know if it's going to go on its own or if we have to hit it, but I, I found this very powerful because he is um, an individual that's big and strong. And he witnessed domestic violence as a young person. And um, I wanted to, to have us hear what he had to say and um, how it impacted him and um, how it changed him. And, and I believe he was the, probably the first generation for a while to break the mold and not uh, continue down the path that he was going down. My earliest memory is my father hitting my mother in the face as hard as he could. And I remember seeing her on the floor and then looking at him this giant of a man who I thought, my God, he says he loves her. What is he gonna do to me? And all I could think, how I want to protect her. How I want to protect her. And how wrong it was. And I said, I gotta be strong. And I gotta get strength so that I can protect her. And every time he came home, we were scared. We didn't know. I literally wet the bed till I was 14 years old because I didn't know what was gonna happen. I would wake up to glass breaking, uh, just sounds, people screaming, and it was a nightmare. We lived a nightmare for years. And I remember my mother coming into our room and saying, we're leaving. Pack our stuff, we're out of here. And we would grab everything we had and we put it in garbage bags. And we'd tie it up and we'd wait to go. Then she'd come back in and she'd say, we can't go. We can't leave. Where am I gonna go? And I just remember feeling like, let's go anywhere. I don't care, we can be on the street. But she couldn't do it. And he went on, terrorizing us, terrorizing us forever. And it was like, what could we do? You have to understand that people in this situation feel entirely hopeless. Hopeless. We were hopeless. So many things, I thought, I'll never be like that. I'll never do that. But then I picked up a lot of other damaging things that come from that trauma a lot of other things that had been assimilated into my life. Here I am, as a man, I felt like, hey, 
It's my way or the highway. I remember times with my daughter, Azrielle, and I would yell at her as if she was a 30-year-old man. I constantly apologize, constantly call them and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Daddy didn't get it. Daddy missed it. And that woke me up. It woke me up. It was this catalyst that changed my life forever. Because here I was, a very successful man. Very successful. But what you have to realize is that success is the warmest place to hide. It does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter. Anyone, anywhere can be victimized. And no, man, woman, or child should ever put up with being treated as less than a human being, ever. How did we get that far off when people are looking the other way? When, when the whole thing is geared where you can't ask for help or you are gonna lose your job? Or if you bring it up, how in the world are you gonna afford an attorney in order to fight this case? You need three things in order to come forward with, with a lot of your damage and the things that happened to you. You need distance emotionally, you need distance financially, and you need distance physically. Coming out with your story is probably one of the hardest things ever. And this is one thing I love about what Safe Horizon provides. It's a safe haven, this place to go, the services that people need. And I'm telling you, this is my company. This is more valuable. You know, I'm, I'm promoting the movies and TV shows and the whole thing, but I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this because it's fixable, see? Understand, this is something that you, we, we can be deprogrammed. This is, the, we have to speak up. You can see it, but you have to show people you are changing the world. So thank you, Kim, for that um, presentation. So next, I almost got confused. We got Kimmy Dermot, or excuse me, Kimmy George next. Uh, will be our final presenter for the night. Uh, she is from Community Encompass, and she's the director of Community Development and Housing Housing Initiatives. Uh, she's been working with Community Encompass for about twelve years now. Yeah, so quite a while. And uh, they provide uh, community-based assessment uh, training. Uh, they also uh, work on things like affordable housing strategies for families. Uh, she mentioned it's her dream that all um, renters and homeowners can be able to afford their homes easily. So we'll turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, it's okay. I'm going to stand up. Uh, I'm not a good sitter. So, um, yeah, so Community Encompass. Uh, you know, we do have several programs. Um, we are the housing resource uh, agent, agency or uh, in the community. So we work with uh, homeless uh, individuals and families. Um, we also um, have a youth program called YEP uh, that provides leadership development and summer work experience and a whole lot of other really cool stuff. We have Sacred Side, which is a laundry and shower facility. Um, we do affordable housing, both rentals and home ownership. And we also uh, have an a urban farm called New Walton Groves. Um, so that's what we do. But I really want to talk about the why of the what. Um, the foundation of who we are, and, and, and I think this will tie in really nicely with all the things that we've heard tonight, some really incredible uh, programs that exist within our community. We are, we are really abundantly blessed with people who care, um, and I think it's just uh, we live in a, uh, an extraordinary community. So um, the Community Encompass was really founded on um, something called Asset-Based Community Development. ABCD is what I'll refer, refer to it going forward. But in a nutshell, ABCD says that everyone, everyone uh, has God-given gifts, talents, and abilities. That within us, uh, we have placed things that we care about, things that we're passionate about, things that we know how to do. And when we are doing those things, when we are participating in those things, it is life-giving to us. And so I love that my favorite part of my work is the why. Um, it's great to build houses and, and you know, do affordable housing and, and, and meet needs and all those things. But really, for me, it's the community. It's the, it's the why. It's the, it's the relationship. So, so 
we say in ABCD that there's kind of this into and with piece. So basically we say that there is an agent, there's agent, there are agencies, organizations, uh, churches, um, uh, associations within communities. And so sometimes those, those entities are in a community. Uh, they have a, a building within a geography. People that are associated with that show up, they do their thing, they benefit from it, and they leave. They make no impact on the community whatsoever. And then there's this second type of entity, this, this, uh, this two type of entity. And basically, same thing, they have a, a structure, a place uh, where they gather within a community. This particular uh, with or to community kind of takes a look around in the community and decides what needs to happen for that place to be better. This is typically a, a very well resourced uh, group that uh, does this assessment that says if, if, if these things happen, then the great news is that these people in this community are going to end up being just like us. And then there is this with type of entity, this with type of organization or group. And they say, you know what? We, we're here. Um, let's get to know who we're here with. Let's be neighbor. Let's build relationship. And then let's connect to the work and the things that neighbors care about that are already happening here. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's use what we have and share it with the rest of the community. It's really kind of a beautiful thing. So community and compass, uh, a lot of people don't know what the EN stands for. And I think that's really, really important. Um, the E in, in compass stands for empowering and the N stands for neighbors, empowering neighbors. And that is so important, right? Um, but the thing about empowering neighbors is it's not to give neighbors power. We already, as human beings, so we already have power. It's simply acknowledging the power that already exists, and it's making room, right, for those gifts, making room for people who care and want to be involved, and affirming those gifts um, and creating space for them, uh, and joining our gifts together. And it is a powerful, powerful thing. And when we do that, right, when we do that, we may have our own gifts and we may make a lot of assumptions about the community that we're with and, and we may even think we know what needs to happen to make it better. But the thing about ABCD is ABCD leads by stepping back, right? There's a lot of trust that has to happen because if I am walking next to you, if I'm journeying next to you, um, I have to trust Right? There are some things about you that I need to trust. I need to believe in your gift as much as I believe in my own. And sometimes in community, especially communities of poverty and broken, in, broken, in, in communities that we would consider broken, um, we feel like we need to come, through, come in with this approach of we've got to come in and tell people what needs to happen. Um, but ABCD says, you know what? I'm going to lead by stepping back. I'm going to guide. And I think any of the people who spoke tonight will all say, they don't come with the solutions. When they're, when they're uh, walking alongside folks, they're not coming with the solutions. What they are is they're, they're helping to journey and guide in the process of healing and wholeness, right? They're acknowledging the good that, are, that exists. And that's the thing about ABCD is it's about the acknowledgement of the good that exists. It's about focus and perspective and I'll share a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, and then the other great thing about ABCD is that it, it, it sets a table that's large and it continues to grow. It doesn't limit the number of chairs um, or even the space, but it says anybody who wants to sit at this table, there's room for you. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter who your family is. If you have desire to sit around this table and be a part of this community, you're welcome. And that table should always grow. It should never get to a point where it is what it's gonna be, but there should always be space for more, always. And um, I think a really good example of kind of what we do sometimes 
in communities of, of poverty and when we assume that a, a community is broken um, is that we set limits, right? We decide what's okay and what's not okay and we decide what the need is. And it's kind of like having a broken arm. If any of you have ever had a broken arm, um, it's a painful thing, right? And it changes you. If once your arm is broken, the doctors can set it, but there's, there's always evidence of a break. Now, if, if you were in community and all we did, and we focused on that broken arm, even after it had healed, and we said, ooh, you know what? You've got that broken arm, let us help you, right? We wanna assist you, we're gonna bring you meals and we're gonna make sure you're okay. And then your arm heals and we continue to say, remember that broken arm though? We're gonna do this really cool thing. However, you've got that broken arm. So we don't wanna trouble you um, you can kind of sit on the sidelines, but we just want to be very cognizant of that broken place that, that you know in your life. And so we continue to focus on that. And eventually what happens is all of a sudden the things that you feel inside of you, the things that you want to be involved in, the things that you care about, we're not inviting you to be a part of it anymore. We're limiting you by, our, by the way that we've labeled you and the way that we see you now. We see you as this person that's broken. And so that's how we, that's our focus, and that's our expectation of you, is that we really don't have a lot of expectation of you. And so you, so you start to feel like you don't have as much value. And then eventually, when all we do is focus on your deficit, on your broken place, uh, all of a sudden, you become a burden to the community because we've got this member, but they really can't do much. And they, you know, they've got that broken arm thing going on, so they can't really lift and they can't, you know. And so all of a sudden, you're no longer a part of community that gets to function and, and benefit from what the community offers. And the community doesn't get to benefit from what you offer. So um, I have a, if you wanna show that slide, I have one slide. All these other folks have done such a wonderful job of, of preparing slides and they have these really great things to say and I have a slide uh, so I'm not fancy uh, so is that that's awesome so there's my glass this is my favorite uh, this is one of my favorite ways to, to talk about community so is the glass half empty or is it half full right that's the the age-old debate is it half empty or half full Asset-based community development is really all about perspective. It's really about how we look at that glass. So if we look at it through its deficiency, it is not filled to the top. It is definitely half empty. There is a half a glass of water that is missing. And when we focus on what is missing, what we get obsessed with is how we're going to maintain what's already in the glass how are we not going to compromise it and lose it? And how are we going to get more? Like there's not enough. And then who gets to drink out of that glass? Because there's only so much available. But when we start to look at that glass and we say, and we celebrate what's in it, and we say, you know what? We've got a half a glass of water. Imagine what we can do with our half a glass of water. And if I've got this, if we've got this half a glass of water, right, who else do we want to join this table? Who else fits in this table that maybe they have something that will go along with this half a glass of water so that we will have abundance, but maybe in a different way, because maybe water is not the only thing we need. So let's take an assessment. Let's take an assess who lives in our community. What do they care about? How are they looking at this glass, right? And how can we, when we acknowledge that, you know what? I might not have a full glass of water. So I'm not living in an imaginary world where I'm not looking for a silver bullet to say, I'm gonna pretend like I, that my glass is full or I'm gonna deny that there's deficit. But what I'm saying is let's focus on the good that exists and let's build upon that. Let's figure out other things, right? But when I say, you know what? My glass isn't quite full. It also means that I'm acknowledging my own need. And that's okay. In community development work, in asset-based community development, it's okay to say, you know what? 
I have this thing. I have this half a glass of water. Carrie, what do you have? Carrie, you have the gift of telling stories. And Carrie, I know a ton of neighbors who have amazing stories, who are just incredible people, who are contributors, contributors to our community. Can I connect you with them? And you can use your gift and your passion for storytelling. And these folks can share their own narrative and so that the world around us can see how incredible our community really is. They can see the good that exists here. And you know what? They just might want to bring their gifts, their passions, the things that they care about. They might just want to join our table too. So, so asset-based community development, that is really kind of the, the you know, the, those are the practices and principles that, that the organization of Community Compass began on. That's how um, all of our programs were really birthed, was neighbors, they were just neighbors sitting around, bringing their gifts, having conversation, dreaming together, because the thing about asset-based community development is, when we stop looking at the deficit, it levels the playing field, and so we all get to be there, and we, when we all get to be there, and we all get to bring our passion and our gifts, then we can dream about not just, you know, what is, but what more could be. You know, how, what is, what is in our best interest and what do we care about within our community? What are our values? Um, what are our priorities? And then how can we dream together and, and make those things happen so that we're all better for it? So that's a little bit in a nutshell about asset-based community development. I appreciate you all being here and listening, the few that were here. And I appreciate that I uh, got to come here. So that's my thing. Thank you very much, Kimmy. Uh, we're going to now go to a few questions. So I will uh, post the questions to our presenters here. We'll have them all join our stream. And I'll call on you one by one just so we don't uh, speak over ourselves here. Uh, so my first question that I want to ask uh, everyone is, uh, just an alum is about trying to heal the world and try to solve problems. So. Uh, what are some ways that other people can get involved with your organization if they would like to help out, if they want to um, try to achieve this? Uh, so let's see. Does anyone feel like they're ready to go for that? Let's go. If, do you want to go first, uh, Kimmy, since you're already warmed up? Oh, sure. Well, we have lots of opportunities for folks to get involved. It um, really depends on what you want to do. And, and it's not necessarily what you can do. It's kind of if you just want to be involved. Um, so you can always uh, get on our Facebook page or on our web page, um, and there's a volunteer application, and you can fill that out. Um, but there is a ton of opportunity um, based on kind of the things that you like to do. You might discover some things that you like to do, too. We're always looking for extra hands on the farm, um, you know, and a variety of different things that are housed, uh, re uh, house that we're rehabbing. Um, so, again, you don't have to have those skills. You might just want to learn but you certainly are welcome to, to join us in the work. Uh, Michael, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, that's a very good question. You know, I, I don't know that I've ever been asked that question about Health West, uh, but I, I, will, I will say this. Uh, there's opportunities. We have uh, volunteers, although through COVID, not a whole lot of volunteers um, for obvious reasons. But uh, we, we do have opportunities on that level for people to get involved. The, the thing that I would say that would be my first, my, the, the direction I would point people initially would be to learn as much as you can about Health West, about what we do, mental health concerns. So we offer quite a few different trainings for free to the public. We have an Eventbrite page. Um, uh, if you search Health West, all one word, and Eventbrite, we're probably going to pop up right away. I would recommend following that and jumping into some of these free trainings, um, many of which are are um, short, um, relatively quickly, an hour and sometimes less uh, topics typically that are out there is, that are of concern to individuals, but also a good understanding of what exactly it is that HealthWest does and how we do it. And then um, being able to also inform other people about it. So, for example, we are able to provide crisis assessment uh, in the community. If you have a, a young person under the age of 18 and they're in a crisis, we're coming to you. 24 hours a day, we're going to come there with an individual with a master's level degree in social work and another social worker, and we're going to do a full assessment 
regardless of ability to pay, regardless of insurance. Just learning these things to be able to spread the word within the community um, is I think quite helpful. That we're there for people. Um, we're a, hopefully a very warm and welcoming environment where people can come in and feel comfortable. Obviously we maintain people's privacy as any health agency does. And I think knowing what we do, learning more about what we do and then sharing it with people who are uh, near to you would probably be the best way. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's go to Carrie if you want to answer any questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, um, I think one of the first and foremost is just be present. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. Our website will show how to get involved with gardening or our link up activities. Sometimes they're just getting together for a block party or different things that are happening, um, especially during the summertime. Um, but be present. We love to get to know each other, whether you're a Muskegon Heights resident or a friend outside of the community. Um, find out what's going on with us. You can reach us pretty easily through our website, Facebook page, and uh, a lot of different ways to get involved, learn new skills, bring skills, uh, but most important, just be present. It's uh, really about relationship building. And then lastly, Yes, um, so we do we do accept volunteers and we accept interns um, who are working on bachelor's or master's degrees. So anybody who's interested, please do check out our website. Um, we like to pair the skills that the individual comes with to something in our organization so that we can uh, satisfy your needs to share your, your, your skills. And also it, be it benefits our clients. Um, a lot of times that might be an art project, might be working at the front desk, might be helping up in the shelter. So we have lots of opportunities. If you're even remotely considering it, just give us a call and we can sit down and talk about it. Thank you, Ken. So uh, my next question that I have for everyone is obviously a COVID's had a pretty big impact on everyone's organizations. Um, what are your kind of expectations post COVID? Do you see that your organization is going to have a lot more volunteers, a lot more need to it? Uh, what do you think things are actually going to be a little easier for your organization? Just kind of give us a, a feel of what that's been like and what you anticipate going forward. Uh, let's start. We'll, we'll go in the same order if you want to go first. Can you have an answer? Um, so, <clears throat> you're talk, uh, so COVID, huh? <laughs> oh, that old thing. Well, you know, um, so it has created some challenges, right, for us to do kind of what we do, which is, uh, you know, convening and talking, meeting with neighbors and, and you know, doing things together. Uh, so when this is, and we've figured out ways to do some of those things a little more safely and a little more limited. Um, but hopefully when things calm down, we'll get back to doing what we love to do, which is connecting with neighbors. Um, and, um, you know, we haven't really stopped in, uh, doing what we do. We've just learned to do it differently. Um, and uh, sometimes I miss, you know, we miss the old ways of doing stuff. Like I said, sitting around tables and just dreaming and talking, but, um, and we'll get there again. But I think some, some, of, some of our processes we've, um, we've streamlined and simplified, and that's good too. All right, we'll go to you, Michael, next. I'm potentially going to sound glass half empty here a little bit, I fear, um, working in the mental health field, all of us working in the helping field. Uh, what, what it looks like and what we know from the research and all indications are that post-COVID, the needs in the, uh, around mental health are going to swell. And the predictions have been this way from very, very early on is that in usually the wake of an epidemic and previous pandemics, we see a spike in mental health needs and that mental health need is likely to be around two to four years after the threat of the pandemic has passed. And it's, it's going to, by all indications, it could be quite overwhelming. The same, what we have heard is the same way that our medical hospitals are being, um, you know, burdened by the number of people needing help with COVID at this point in time that mental health providers 
are going to also see a dramatic increase and could very well be overburdened and stretched real thin. And so uh, in the short run, and I keep encouraging uh, those who work in social work around me, uh, my fellow coworkers, some who work harder than me by far, working with individuals directly within the community, is I just say to people, let's do this and let's do this together. We're going to come out on the other side of this and we're going to have stories to tell that you know we were able to do this and help people through one of probably the worst experience globally that you know certainly we've ever had in our lifetimes so the short run things are looking tough things are going to be very very difficult we're short staffed as everybody is currently and uh, we're hoping that we can at least have the staff to deal with what the expected glut that could be coming our way with people in need just like others on the panel here today. So we're gonna be here. Um, it's it's gonna be challenging and it's really gonna take a village. And the other, the other thing I would say, sorry, I'll drag it out a little bit more, is that quite often there is this belief that here's my loved one, they have an addiction problem, take them and get them well. Here's my loved one, they have a mental health problem, put them in a hospital or take them somewhere and get them well. And that's not how mental health concerns typically work. Um, they work just like many other illnesses in which when somebody is diagnosed with a, a, a substance use concern or a mental health concern, um, the, the hospitals and the professionals can do just so much and the family and the community needs to come around that individual and support them through that process of getting well and hopefully on the road to recovery. And that's not how we typically do things within the mental health world and within the addiction world for a whole lot of reasons. So I would just encourage people moving forward, when you learn about somebody who's struggling with depression or with some mental health concern or addiction, um, go towards that person and provide support as, as best as you can. That's what we're going to need. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go to Karen next. Uh, yeah, COVID. Um, one thing I think it really, you know, it, it reminded us how much we really do need each other uh, and how this community came out to, to, to the important things about uh, making sure people were all right, checking in, and uh, really sort of um, solidified that, that community feel. And um, a lot of our work was done in, you know, the, the schools. Uh, so during that time, uh, without access, you know, to the to the children, the students, uh, for the gardening programs and libraries, it 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 kind of challenged us and taught us to to try new things. Uh, who knew that our garden coordinator was such a star on video um, and could garden so well that uh, you know we've we've made uh, little videos of the garden program and how to make the snacks and the school put them in the in the uh, online virtual learning. We worked with the food service. Uh, organizations that they, you know, we'd harvest the gardens and it would go to the food service and they'd make sure that got packed up and sent home to the family so that uh, students could create that snack that they saw in the video. And that's something, you know, there's, that's just one of many things we had to sort of pivot, but while we can't wait until we can fully um, um, be together uh, physically and, and things are, you know, sort of still fluid, uh, there's some things that that we learn during this that we're not going to let go. Um, it's going to be a hybrid or there's going to, but, but we're going to sort of mix uh, some of the technologies and, and things that we learn. Um, and I think that in the end, we'll, we'll have grown from it. Um, one of the things too is, you know, who knew so much about virtual meetings, right? But while we still like to be sort of physically together, there is a, a, a wonderful thing about sort of accessibility that that, that really opened up. Um, and so to be able to have those who maybe couldn't uh, arrive in person still be a part of things. Um, so just things like that, that I think that um, while it was, it was you know, difficult to sort of navigate through, still has its challenges, there are certain things, uh, first of all, that we, you know, beautiful things we learned about our community. We already knew, but it just sort of uh, highlights what's really important. And then um, the things we learned that we'll take forward. So I've said from almost the beginning of COVID that um, survivors, spe specifically domestic violence survivors, have undergone the ramifications of COVID during their whole victimization. They've had health concerns, financial concerns, and they've been in isolation. 
And so for the rest of the community to rise to that, I think that brings attention to a um, sub pandemic, if you will, mini pandemic that's going on with those individuals that has been going on in private. Um, but when it affected our community, then I think, you know, it's time to raise that awareness a little more. But I, for one, am very um, optimistic about the resilience and the strength of both the individuals we work with and our community. Um, I've seen, I'm not from here originally, and I've seen some amazing things, and um, I feel supported every single day. So it's not going to be easy, but nothing worthwhile ever is. And so I'm, I'm optimistic. All right, I've got just an individual question for everyone that I would like to ask here. Uh, so I'm going to start, we'll, we'll go in our same order here, so I'll start with Kimmy first. Uh, you talk about empowering neighbors and neighborhoods. Uh, what's kind of your ideal empowered neighborhood look like? How does it work? Um, I think it's where, um, you know, everybody feels like they have place and value, where um, we together uh, find our common voice and common language um, and that together we decide, right, um, what the values and the, and the priorities of our community are, and that we feel like there's, um, that uh, our voice is acknowledged, heard, and uh, respected at the table, right? Um, <clears throat> I think too often, you know, we want to, we do want to take a silver bullet approach, and we want, we want one thing to fix it all, and this is a very slow, steady process. But um, it's so important that um, that we that neighbors know that they are the creators of the process. They um, are the stakeholders. Their voice should be the biggest voice, um, and really, uh, their voices should together collectively determine the direction of our community. Um, and and that to me, that's the dream, right? Where everyone uh, feels and knows. Um, that uh, that their that their voice has value, um, and that uh, that everybody's not going to get their way, right? And that's not the point. It's that that it's always about the greater good, um, and that even when there is conflict, because I'm not looking for a conflict-free world. I don't think that's real or healthy. But when there's respect in the conflict. Um, and we, res we have, because we have relationship, we have respect for each other, um, and we manage that conflict, and we move forward, understand, we compromise, and we, we negotiate um, for the greater good. That's the dream, right? Um, and uh, I want to say just one thing, you know, when you talk about in the next couple of years, how we're looking at um, a lot of mental health issues uh, coming to light because of this, and I appreciate that so much because we fear in this community sometimes um, mental health issues, and we use it as a way to label people and limit people. And that's a, it's a piece, of, a, a, it's a thing in our lives and for many of us, but it doesn't define who we are and what we can do. And I think in the, in the COVID's not gonna be over just because we might not have to mask in public and just because we might not have to get as many booster shots. Um, and we, we, we need to be in it for a long haul in this, you know, in community, right? Um, and that's part of that empowerment too, right? Is to say that I have something, I'm a neighbor. And so, and I know that my, the person next door or down the street is struggling as a neighbor, I can go ahead and um, um, I can knock on that door and I can reach out and I might not have uh, the means to, to, to feed them a great big meal, but um, I bet you I could, make a sandwich and sit across that table from them and um, just be. And so, and I think there's so much value to that. And I think we as community need to remember that um, just because we are okay, it doesn't mean everybody's okay. Um, and it's okay when we struggle too. Um, I just think that, you know, um, we need to uh, understand that a, a truly beautiful community is messy. And there's beauty in the chaos and there's beauty in the mess if we look at it and we find it and we focus on it. And, um, and yeah, anyway, so. That actually kind of segues in nicely to my question I have for Michael here. Uh, you know, talk a lot about mental health and a lot of the uh, 
um, issues around it. So my question to you, Michael, is you know if you're someone that is struggling, you know what's a good way or some tips for them to try and bring that up to friends and family, to try and seek that help they need. I think a lot of times that's a big struggle for someone to realize they they need that help and who they can turn to. Yeah, it's it's truly one of the one of the probably uh, probably one of the more tricky things, right? Depending especially on who that person is, what they do for a living, how old they are, what gender they are. There's so many things that impact um, people's ability or their ease at maybe discussing it. You know, again, I, I would I would say that if if I were the individual, if I were speaking to the individual that had the concern. I would encourage them to, to have that discussion. I think the best you can do is just encourage them to say out loud, give voice to the situation that they are under. Again, putting it back on the medical model, this is about a brain that's not working correctly or not working the way we wish it would, right? Um, something's gone wrong. And of course, I would encourage people to, to just have that conversation with the person they feel closest to, with the person they trust the most. And if that means it could be a stranger and having to call Health West, um, we have people there who will speak to people um, soon to be 24 hours a day. We do have 24 hour a day service, but our staff on site are not there 24 hours a day, but soon they will be. I think more um, that first step towards seeking help is often um, a difficult step, right? That very first step is often the most difficult. And sometimes because it is our brain that is involved <clears throat> and the way that we're thinking, uh, we may not see the value in taking that first step or we may be scared of taking that first step or we may be fearful of stigma about taking that first step. <clears throat> so often people do not self-refer. And this is why it has to be about community and about the people around us who are supporting us willing to have that conversation with us and ask those questions. And if we're initially sort of pushed away by that person to say, no, no, everything's fine, understanding that saying to that person, well, I'm here, my door is always open, you're safe with me. And then returning to that conversation at a later point in time, if that individual doesn't approach you. Mental health concerns are tricky. Addiction is tricky and it's not always a clear cut path. But I think every one of us, regardless of what the suffering is about, whether it's a physical illness, a mental health concern, just having somebody who um, is there for us, willing to listen to us, willing to speak to us, um, goes a long way. And so we have to start to be that person for others around us. I wish there was an easier answer for somebody who was struggling, who was struggling, but it just comes in so many different forms and just some people often do not see the need for it. And as I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't mention, in America, we wait an average of 11 years before we go seek help for a mental health concern. That speaks to the struggles and the difficulties with approaching the system or approaching even people around us we love. 11 years we wait to go get help on average in America. And if our thoughts, our behavior, and our emotions are being impacted, we struggle with, we have those three areas being impacted, our thoughts, our emotions, our behavior. And if it begins to impact our ability to focus on work or school, it begins to impact our ability to take care of our daily needs, taking a shower, brushing our teeth, feeding the kids, cleaning the house. And it begins to impact the relationships around us. This is what mental health problems will do. When that goes on for five or six weeks, it's time to seek help. And the average American waits 11 years. And so often it's not about the individual. Sometimes it's gotta come from somebody outside who's seeing the signs that something isn't going right. So I didn't really answer the question directly about the person. It can be tricky. I would encourage anybody who's struggling to reach out though. Reach out to people around you. And I would encourage those people who get reached out to, to listen, listen deeply. And then we're here in the community, 722-HELP, the phone number 231-722-HELP, 24 hours a day. And as I said, if it involves a young person in a crisis, we're coming to you in the middle of the night, whenever, regardless of insurance, regardless of ability to pay. That's a huge thing for any community. And we can do that at Health West. We do similar for adults as well, mobile crisis response too. Uh, 
Carrie, I'm going to jump over to you here. You talked a lot about um, different media that you've created to help kind of show uh, how things are, give people a voice. Is there an easy way for people to find some of those finished products that you've created with the CCP or with Grand Valley State University? Um, I would say the easiest way is probably through our website. Um, I do believe that there's some links because a lot of it is is things we've collaborated with and they reside at other places, but there's usually a cross uh, um, link. Um, and then reach out to us if you don't see, you know, certain things that I've talked about here, but go to our website first and look there. Um, also, um, I'd like to encourage people to maybe use their cell phones and, and things like that to tell their own stories. Uh, you know, it's something that that uh, we find ours, get inspired, um, but really the more stories and the more personal experiences, uh, I think that um, it's, it's interesting to understand how these things are framed. So. All right, Kim, uh, my uh, question for you is, uh, you know, are there ways that your video that we showed here talks a lot about uh, the fear that both he and his mother had about being in that situation there. Is there anything that, you know, friends can do or people in that situation that kind of help them kind of conquer that fear to get them uh, out of that situation. Um, that's a tough one. The average person um, leaves seven times before they leave for good. So some leave 20, some leave one, you know, however the math works. It's very, very, very difficult. And so when somebody makes that decision and they commit to it, um, that's why it's so incredibly important that we greet them with open arms and honesty and um, and everything we should to show them that they made the right decision because we might not get another chance. Um, it's a very, very hard time for them. A lot of times individuals don't come in, they just call. It starts with a phone call. And so what we do over the phone calls, we'll safety plan with them talk to them about if there's guns in the house, you know, how are the kids? We just generally try to let them know we're here. Um, we don't ever, you know, we understand they're gonna leave and go back and it's it's a cycle. Um, some don't, but most do. And so to say, you know, we offer to go to people's houses if we if there's a law enforcement present, we offer to um, go to a scene as long as it's cleared. You know, we try to be there as early as we possibly can in any tragedy or trauma because if we miss that opportunity and the the abuser gets to them first or or they start doubting themselves then we've lost we've lost them, you know that opportunity so um it's it's really difficult it's different with every every single individual but the main thing is is when we do have that opening that we we take it and we embrace it and we give them what they ask for and what they need All right, thank you very much, Kim, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we did post links to everyone's uh, webpage on the videos here, and we'll post these videos. So if you did catch all of it or you want to watch another part over again, uh, we will have those available to everyone in the public. So uh, once again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you for those uh, that joined us online watching our presentation. Hopefully everyone found it very informative and interesting and made you think a little bit about that principle of you know, long or healing the world. All right, everyone, have a good night. Thank you so much.